back to the What the Fork podcast. Today's guest is not only a former Stoke, Watford and current Yeovil defender, but he's also currently king of the Tony Pulis impressions on Twitter. Welcome to the show, Carl Dickinson. How are you doing, Carl? Are you all right? Yeah, I'm all good, mate. How are you? Strange times. It's, uh, to be honest, I've not, not been too bad with it. Um, I think my wife's doing her head and doing the homeschooling more than anything. But, um, <laughs> it's just been a case of just controlling what you can control, really. I'm, I'm trying not to think about it too much. Just do the workouts I've got to do, go for a run when I get a chance. And, and basically just do that. I might try and, try and do all the jobs my wife's got lined up for me. <laughs> do you have like a training program and stuff from the, the overall strength and conditioning coach and the physios and stuff like that? Or Yeah, they've sent one through. So we've got stuff, we've got certain runs we can do, certain gym exercises. Lucky enough to be in a stage where, you know, a lot of us haven't got gyms in, in the houses kind of thing. So we're quite limited limited in terms of that no it's, it's like i say it's just basically trying to do as much as you can with with what you've got and yeah like that, i'm quite i'm quite lucky where i live with you know there's quite a few fields around so i can always go in a long run long distance run and there's a few hills in there so i can get all that done mate so no, i'm quite lucky where i am actually so like i say it's just a case of just cracking on and not worrying about anything too much obviously staying away from people as much as you can now just trying to do the right things mate and for those who haven't seen it you've been doing one or two i must say good impressions on twitter have you always done impressions or is that a new thing mr pulis one it's obviously been there for a while there's a few others that i've not bought out yet but no it's just i don't know it was just something that i'll see something i'll i'll give it a go and Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Have you got any of Liam Lawrence? Because I, I would like to see a Liam Lawrence, I'm not going to lie. I can't, I can't, I can't do Liam. He's too, <laughs> he's too, he's too from like Retford and all that way, isn't he? So he's, yeah. he's, he's got a certain twang that I can't really just, do. Just get some blonde curtains and do Liam Lawrence circa 2004, 2005. You'll be absolutely fine. Uh, I'll, have to, I'll have to stick a plastic nose on as well that grows it a bit. So. <laughs> yeah. So sort of going back to the right at the beginning of your career then, you're, you're born in, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, but is it Sw- Swanland Court? That's like Derby way, I think. Well, is that right? No, it's people, well, whoever's wrote whatever anywhere, it's been given the wrong information. I was actually born in a place called Sutton and Ashfield in Nottinghamshire. So, yeah, just not far from Derby, obviously. I saw it in Ashfield near Nottinghamshire. I lived near Renneth, near Mansfield that way, till I was about four or five. And then, obviously, because my old man's work, it, uh, we moved over to a place near Swaddling Coat that way. So, I pretty much lived there most of my life up until I was about 21. So, who, did you, who were you growing up supporting? Grew up supporting Forest. All my family are Forest fans. So I was brought up watching watching videos of them, um, the occasional Man United one, because my old man supported Man United. So, uh, a lot of Ryan Giggs talk, Ryan Giggs, Stuart Pearce, all them players, Clough, all of them. So, uh, yeah, I was pretty much brought up on those two teams. But you started at Derby, didn't you? Like, it was Derby where you were at before Stoke was a youth player. Yes, I think I was 10, maybe 11 when uh, I joined Derby. I was actually playing for my old man's team at the time on, on a Sunday morning. And uh, it, was, it was weird on actually. The scout wasn't even meant to be watching my game. It was only because it was half time. He thought he'd come over and watch. So that was it. So when you signed for Derby, being a Forest fan, was there any doubt? Nah, I mean, it, it didn't come into my head at, at, at my age then. It was, you know, trying to go and test myself against better lads and seeing what it was all about. Obviously, me, my brothers and my mother gave me a, a, a few little digs about it being Forest <laughs> and going to Derby. But um, no, I mean, it was just like, I got invited for the trial. Uh, I think it was, yeah, three, maybe four weeks of trial. And then signed from that. It was just, like I say, I was just happy to go and see if I could be as good as some of the other lads that were there. So how did the, the move to Stoke come about then? Because obviously, you, I think you were at Derby a couple of years, but then moved onwards towards Stoke. So I think I think Derby would have been in the Premiership at that time and Stoke would have been uh... Championship. Is that right? Yes, they would have been, I think. Yeah, I think they would have been. Now, basically, when I was 14, I, I got offered another deal to sign on again. But um, there was a bit of, uh, basically, the academy director at the time, a fella called John Peacock, 
who I'm pretty sure still works in the FA now. Um, he basically said to me that he never, he, he didn't think I was going to be a footballer. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I hadn't been for one of the part-time coaches at the time in my age group, an ex-player called David Nish, played for England and Leicester, yeah. he, um, then he wouldn't have kept me on. But I, from that moment, it already given... I think it was four, maybe five scholarships out at under 15. Those were the likes of Tom Muddleston. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lee Holmes, who's at Exeter. Nathan Doyle, who used to play for Luton, Barnsley. Yeah. So they gave a few. And I just thought, do you know what? I'm, there's, there's no way I'm getting anywhere here. So I thought the best thing was at the time, because I, like where I lived at the time, there was a, an actual Stokes City Scout. There and he said, "Yeah, if you if you want to go, I can take you." So it was literally all done, and within two three days, I'd left Derby and joined and, and gone to training with Stoke. Literally from that moment, I was playing there, signed on. Uh, two weeks later, played against Derby, scored, <laughs> and that was it. From there, that was that was the start of my Stoke journey. From that, who was the the youth team coaches at Stoke then? The youth team coaches. What one when I joined as a fifteen year old? Yeah, like so. I suppose when you first went and all the way through up until obviously you got into the first team. So I'm guessing. So, so yeah. So when I was under sixteen, the U team coach at the time would have been a fella called Ian Cranston, ex centre half for Stoke. Tough, really tough. So yeah, I was quite lucky actually. When I was still under sixteen, uh, there was a couple of us getting caught up to go and play with the U team on a Saturday. So that was a bit of an eye opener because. Uh, there was a couple of big lads in the youth team at the time. It was a, it was a new thing for me. But yeah, Ian Cranston at the time was brilliant with me. And then from that age group, my manager at the time was Noel Blake. My first year of my scholarship was, um, it was actually a fella called um, Dave Kevin. He was brilliant with me. Um, so the first year was a bit of an eye at the start of my scholarship because he pulled me to one side and said, you're not going to play much at all this year. And mm-hmm. I think I ended up playing, I think I actually ended up playing the most that year out of everyone. And then the second year, Noel Blake took over the youth team. It was a good thing, obviously, for me, for me knowing him under 15 stroke 16 days. I think I actually made my debut in my first year at my scholar. Yeah, I think, yeah. At 17, I made my debut against Coventry. I think I come on for Steve Staunton was still playing. Come on for about four or five minutes. Uh, Clyde Clark was playing left back at the time. I was actually warming up, uh, and he was like, "You ready?" And he goes, "What do you mean?" I was standing outside the side of the pitch. He he pretended he was injured just so I could come on and make my debut. I'll never forget that. He was yeah, it was different class. Literally just said, "Oh, pretended went down injured, said he hurt his hamstring or something," and I just, that was it. I got the shout. You're on four or five minutes. How was Clive Clark? Because obviously he was held in, in really high regard. Um, a lot of clubs he was at, but being a Sunderland fan, obviously you had the the famous Roy Keane quote when he had obviously the problems with his heart and things like that and that quote came out. He, he was quite a well-liked lad, wasn't he, elsewhere? Did he, was he quite a good mentor? Clark, he was brilliant. You know, he, he was he was one of them that demanded, came in and give it everything every day. And if, and if he didn't, he would let you know about it. I think, you know, that's that was why I was quite lucky in a way of the people at Stoke at the time when I was first getting into the first team and then moving on from there, the people that who were who were there at the time were, were big characters, like big men. Didn't take any shit basically. He was he was different class. He was some player as well. I don't think people misjudged how technically good he was at times. Obviously devastating what, what happened to him. But yeah. For me to to see the way he went about his business day in, day out, and the way he trained and the way he demanded the best from people and himself it was something that I did really enjoyed watching and something I thought that, you know, maybe I could take that in, into my game as well. Did you make your debut under a Pulis? Because I know he was there and left and then came back, but I think you would have made your debut under Pulis at, when you first came yes. on against Coventry, wouldn't you? Yes, I did, yeah. Yeah, he was... Uh, <laughs> uh, I remember the first time he... He called me up, it was pre-season, and he pulled me over. I was actually 
running with the youth team at the time. He pulled me over, shouted me over, and he went, oh, I want you to run up this hill as quick as you can. The first team were off doing some sort of warm-up. I thought, I can't, I can't let the gaffer down here. So I sprinted as fast as I could up this hill. Good, I must have got a good time, because by the time I'd come back down, the first team players had um, finished their warm-up. And he went, right, you've all got 10, run, uh, 10 runs up this hill. That Deco's just done. You got to get in on this time. That was my first introduction to the first team, and I got a bit of a let's say a bit of a bollocking. But <laughs> uh, I quickly learned to um, pace myself a bit better on any other runs that he told me to do. But um, <laughs> he, yeah, from from that moment forward, the, the first team man, Mister Pulis, was a different class for me. You actually really got like your first chance, I suppose, under under Boss Camp, really, in terms of playing like regular. Because I know you played under Pulis, but it was it was Boss Camp that like blooded quite a few youngsters. Did did you quite like playing under Boss Camp? Do you still have a lot of respect for him because he was, was the one that gave you your first sort of real chance? It was. Uh, I I can only speak on. The way he was with me, he was he was different class. He, especially with the younger boys, he always wanted you to. As soon as you got into the training ground, he wanted you out, and he wanted you to have like a thousand touches before training had even started. He was really good in terms of how he wanted to bring the the younger boys on and develop them and try and make them be part of the first team and play games. And he was don't get me wrong, he. he he didn't move much. He was quite a big fella, <laughs> so a lot of the co- a lot of the coaching. Oh God, what was his name? I think it was Yanni. I think I might be wrong with that. No, I did a different class. I managed to get my first start under him uh, against Sheffield United. Um, I think I, I think I signed pro actually a few days later after that. But yeah, like I say, he, he was brilliant. He gave us younger lads a massive chance, really, and a chance to play at a good level as well. So, yeah, that was pretty much, I guess he kind of pretty much started us off, really, in terms of being able to play more games and, and get used to the demands of the league a bit more. I, th- I find it quite a thing that happens quite often with Dutch managers and people like that. They will give youth a chance. Do you think it's like a, a Dutch thing where they, they just believe in youth maybe more than other nations do? Yeah, definitely. I think I think it's the same with a lot of things. How else are you going to know if, if you don't try it? Wenger's one of the, the main ones for saying about younger players, you know, they're, they're going to make mistakes. If they're training well and they deserve to play, I'm, I'm going to stick them in. They are going to cost you points, but I've got to stick them in and see how much they can develop. I think that's that's why a lot of the better Dutch teams, like you look at Ajax, some of the players they brought through, it's, it's incredible, Scary. really. Yeah. And yeah, I just I just think sometimes there's a, a different mentality, less pressure in different mm-hmm. countries. Yeah, that's true. Uh, in terms of getting results, but yeah, I mean, I think it's just one of them. It's, you just got, you just got to give it a go. If if it doesn't work, then then you know, then don't you? You know that they're not ready, and you can maybe take them out again, and and bring them back in a few months down the line, or you just think, no, that's it. I'm, I don't think you're ready for it, and you move on. Yeah, very true. There was a, there was like the the season didn't go as well, I think, as anyone expected uh, for Boss Camp because I think. Him coming into the club was kind of Stoke's push for promotion at that point. But obviously, I think when he left, there was there was sort of like an argument between some of his staff or, or something like that and the, the director of football, which sort of ended up with him leaving in the end, I, I believe. But th- as a, a player for the team, did you find anything about that or was him leaving still quite a shot? I I didn't really get to see or hear much of any any of it, really, because... At that point, I was still dipping in and out of the first team dressing room and the youth team dressing room. There was there was bits that we didn't really know about. I know there was obviously something went off because you could tell um, the vibe at training some days wasn't great. It was, a, it was a bit frosty some mornings walking in. You could just instantly get a, a bad vibe, which is never good around around a football club. It all ends up being, I've heard this, I've heard that. And, Rumours quickly spread them in. I just think I just think it had ran its course. I think the arguments that happened were allowed to spill out further than they should have done. It it wasn't gonna last much longer than than that, to be honest with you. Yeah, kind of beginning of the end, isn't it, when that sort of stuff happens? Obviously, when a, a manager goes, you think, who's coming in next? Is he going to fancy me? Is he going to really like me? Is this going to be a chance? 
And then Tony Pulis is the person that ends up coming back. So when you have someone that you've got so much probably faith in and, and got a relationship with, were you secretly absolutely delighted that it was Pulis that came back? Y- yeah, but I thought, considering me, that had been, what, 18, round 19 nearly, I thought this this is where I've got to really show him that oh, I want to play here. Come back pre-season, just, just give it everything I've got. But yeah, to see to see him come back, obviously raised my spirits a lot in terms of the fact that he liked me before he left. So I thought, you know what, if I can if I can carry on trying to impress him, there might be a route here for me to to obviously play a lot more. How do you impress someone like Tony Pulis? Because he seems very much in the Sam Allardyce mode that they like what they like and and that's it. But how do you go about impressing someone like Tony Pulis? Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm I, I'm I must have been the type of player and the type of person he liked. But for me, it was it was just a case of be, being in early, doing all my work, making sure I was doing everything I could you know, in the gym, just giving everything in training and working, working my nuts off every day. Just trying to not, obviously you're going to get a bit, of, a bit of shit from the older lads, the older experienced yeah. lads at the time. Because, at that time, I'd well, I say at that time, I still like to do it. I, I like to fly into a couple of tackles, even in training. <laughs> um, so I had to get <laughs> had a, a couple of words said, but um, no, nah, I think I think you like that because I was willing to do that, and I was willing, you know, maybe sometimes I probably did was a bit too much in training sometimes, but for me, that was the way I needed to be in my own head to. To impress him, to, to, to yeah. try and make him put it in his head that you know I'm I'm not fucking about. I want to be here. I want to be part of this yeah. group. You did obviously get into the side under Pulis a lot more regularly than maybe you had done previously, but um, he did send you out on loan to to Blackpool and you played yeah. under. Simon Grayson, um, I think loan moves for young lads can be massively important. But how important was the move to Blackpool for you? Huge, huge. I think I played in a reserve game away at Forest, and then I think it was a day or maybe two later that Mr. Pulis had said Blackpool won you. See, that was it. You're off there. Um, that was it. I joined for a month. Uh, yeah, I think it was a month at Blackpool, but loved it. Loved it. The instant connection with the lads. Uh, first game was away at Crew, um, and I think I think we got a late winner. Might be wrong, but we won. We won that game, and I don't know. Just like I'd almost joined a group that was just as together, uh, good lads, and more so for me learning about a different probably a different side of football, obviously a different level that I'd never played at. And um, being a part of a group where, you know, they're, they're not on anywhere near the, the money that Stoke, some of the Stoke boys were on at that time. So a completely different set up to changing rooms, training ground, all that sort of stuff. And, you know, I, I was actually quite lucky, really, because <laughs> the first day I joined, uh, the kit man was like, oh, yeah, you need to take your kit home and wash it. And, I, you know, I, me at that time, I'd, I'd never been in that position where I'd needed to happen. I'd, I'd been lucky yeah. enough where, do you know what I mean? It was, it was all new to yeah. me. But, look, yeah. but luckily, I, I, <laughs> I managed to talk the kit man around to, for him doing it because I was on loan. Um, <laughs> but I managed to get away with it. In, in terms of the loan move, I loved I loved every second of it. It was it was brilliant. I, I really felt it was the perfect move for me. Really, I, I struck up a good connection with the rest of the lads. I, I got on with them really well. There was some good lads there. Uh, there some good lads there at the time. You know, probably the best one was Wes Houlihan. Great player. Yeah, he he played it. He was playing left wing in front of me at the time. So yeah, I mean, it was it was good as well because we were winning games, doing well. I was pleased, really pleased with how I was doing myself. So yeah, it, it was it was a good, it was a really good loan move, and it's it's something that you know it, it annoys me a bit nowadays that some young lads aren't willing to go out and do that because for me, it's it's the best thing you can do. 
Yeah, and, and everyone that's ever been on that sort of one or two month loan spell away from like the clubs and have done well and had a long career have always said that like one month or six month loan spell, whatever it is, has been probably one of the most pinnacle, most important parts of their career. Do you almost feel sorry for people who don't get that opportunity or, or decide not to do that? Yeah, because it's you you almost leaving yourself in a bubble. You, you go out, you got you you get to meet new managers, new sets. Different type of fans, different type of football. You end up making new friends. It's it's a massive, massive thing, and it's also somewhere where you can go and show your ability. You know, you, in a way, the pressure's kind of on you a little bit because you're probably going from a bigger club to a a lower league club. So it's you know you you kind of have to step it step up to the plate. You try you, you try and impress your new team. You try and impress. Your, your employers that you're on loan from because obviously they'll be reporting back but for me it's it's something that every young lad should have to do yeah and unless unless they're unless they're obviously that good enough where they can just go straight into the first team for me any lad that's not playing at 18 19 20 you need to go out and learn. you have to you have to you you got to you got to be part of something where you, you're going to be training all week knowing you're going to be playing in a game on a saturday because it's it's the best feeling it's the best feeling in the world where you know you, you get up on a Saturday morning and you know you you've got a tough game ahead or you, it's just one of them for me. You have you have to go out on loan if, if you're not playing. Talking about that loan spell when you came back, the season later was when you played the most amount of games for Stoke. I think you played 30 games, one promotion at the Premier League. And I was looking through that side. And I mean, a lot of people look at that Stoke team and they'll mention Rory Delap and his long throws. But look, like that team, Ricardo Fuller, Liam Lawrence, Shawcross, all spent a long time at the, the club. And that's when they really started to come to fruition, I think, um, or became huge players in the years to come. How enjoyable was that time at Stoke when you like, got into the team alongside probably one of the best Stoke teams of the recent era? It was amazing. It was amazing. I mean, the group we had, it's just a great group. Just a really, really great group. Even if even if we were arguing or said anything on the training ground, as soon as training was done or a game was done, that was it. There was nothing else said. It was back to being mates again. It was it was one of them. It was I've never I've honestly never been in another group like it. We 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 did all sorts of stuff together. We'd go for a beer together when it was appropriate. But other than that, the, the demands we put on each other and the standards, don't get me wrong, we we, we had a laugh, like. <laughs> so, a lot of pranksters in the group at that time. But, Who's the um, biggest one? Oh, my God. <sighs> Higgy would be up there. <laughs> Andy Griffin. He was a disgusting human being. Because <laughs> <laughs> he played for Newcastle, that's um, no, he was, he, was, he was a top man, though. He was a great lad. A set of lads that no egos. We knew what we were about. We knew how the manager wanted us to play. We knew how fit we were. The mentality we had with everyone that, you know, no one's no one's coming to do us over. We'll scrap for everything. If we lose, fair enough, but we're going to scrap and do everything we can. And And that was the group we had. And obviously that, comes from Tony Pulis doing his homework on the type of lads he wants to be associated with. He wants his group like that. And I think that was the start of, obviously, a successful time in Stokes' period. And for me, it was it was one of the... It's probably my best feeling in football that I've ever had on that on that last day. And we, when we got promoted, it was, it was something, you know, that will, will live with me forever. And you know, it, it still when I talk about it and think about it, it gives it does send a little shiver down my spine. Um, but like I say, I was I was still twenty twenty one at the time. I'd, I'd, I'd had a bit of a bad a bad thing happen. I lost my old man that year. That was a that was a, a new one to deal to deal with. But the way the the lads and the manager and the staff and everyone looked after me, it was um, like I say, it's 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 something that will will stay with me how how good that group was and how good they were with me being a, a younger lad there at the time. With Stoke at that point as well, because I think it's different for a fan. 
you can look at a team and you can sort of feel if a team's going to get promoted or they're going to be there or thereabouts. And I remember the season before, I'm sure you finished about seventh because you started doing quite well the season before. But as a player, is there ever a point when, like, or is there a point in the season where you think, you know what, actually, we're going to go up here or we're going to get bloody close? Yeah, there was one, there was one game uh, we played Coventry away. We'd sat in the chain room and Mr. Pulis had decided to to play like a, a a clip of any given Sunday, the Al Pacino yeah. clip. Yeah. And so we, we were sat in the changing room watching that. When we were walking out, it was like, yeah, right, let's have it kind of thing. You you just look round. No one said a word. You just look round. You just knew. You just knew that it was like, right, come on then, let's have it. I think... I think Liam actually scored a late goal or to make it 2-1 and great finish as well. And as soon as we got back in the changing room, for me, and I'm sure a few of the other lads at that time would probably say the same, for me, that was the game where I thought, yeah, this is it. This is, we're going up here. There's no, there's no one that's going to stop us now. We're, we're too, how can I put it? We've got too much momentum to yeah. To the not, momentum so huge. Yeah, it, it, we've got too much momentum for someone to stop us, and it was yeah, like I said, no one really said a word. You could just you just knew what people were thinking. It was it was a weird feeling actually being in that dressing room after. But for me, that was the game where I thought, yeah, we're going up here. So you know, you do go up, and then you have that typical chat in the summer and. I think, you know, me being a Sunderland fan, you playing for Stoke, I think we're all used to that sort of chat where everyone's sort of writing you off and telling you where you need more quality and where you haven't got enough quality. I think you got beat off Bolton, first game of the season, but then yeah. went on to beat Villa 3-2 the weekend later. And it's a game remembered for like that Ricardo Fuller goal, but um, oh that's a, uh, yeah, unbelievable, wasn't it? Um but what what was the feeling like in the dressing room leading up to that game? Was it kind of like a like screw you, we're gonna prove you wrong sort of thing when we are ready for this league? The the Villa game. Yeah. Yeah, um because um, yeah, I'd come on as a sub for like less than ten minutes in the Bolton game. And yeah, you know, obviously we sat back in the changing room, devastated first game in the Premier League and you know, we wanted to, to get off to a good start. I think the next day or on the Monday, we'd seen that all the bookies had paid out on us to go down. So, yeah, we were like, right, and big two fingers up to everyone kind of thing. We got ready for that Villa game all week, thinking, right, we, we're going to show everyone what we're about. And <clears throat> I was lucky. I was lucky I was starting that game. I don't know, you, you just... Like I say, you're you part of something sometimes where you have these weird feelings in dressing rooms and tunnels where you just get a feeling that you're going to win. You just know. And walking out that day, red hot day, <laughs> the atmosphere was absolutely incredible. We managed to nick it right at the end off Big Mama's back from Mama, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Big Mama's back off uh, Rory's throne. But Ricardo's goal that day, I mean, if, if Messi or anyone else had scored had scored that goal, they'd still be showing it now. I mean, yeah. it's, it's the best goal I've seen in a game I've played in. Some rip up that goal because he could just do something like that out of nothing. He was, he was some still player. Playing. Still, still playing. Play, still at Nantwich Town, I think. Nantwich, yeah. He, Nantwich. he played um, a few weeks ago against... Uh, so South, South Shields would technically be my local club. And he played okay. the other week, I think, away from home. And he's, he's still scoring. Not too happy at the minute, are they, South Shields? Understandably so, probably, <laughs> as well. But they're, not, they're not the most chuffed on the planet, mate. No, definitely no. not. How good was Ricardo Fuller? Frightening. Frightening. He's, it was crazy, really. He'd, he'd, he'd been running with the ball, and sometimes you'd think, oh, no, where's he gone down a bit of a... <laughs> you know, where's he going to get out of this? And then all of a sudden... He comes out of it. He's got the ball. He he could just do some magic, mate. He was honestly he, probably the, the best player I've I played with in terms of creating something from nothing. He was he was that good, mate. On his day, he was he was right. So strong, quick, skillful. He he had everything. If it, I, 
honestly think if it hadn't been for a couple of bad little injuries he had at bad times in his career, he'd have, he'd have played for, let's say, the one of the so-called top 10 bigger clubs, if you know what I mean. One player at Stoke that's always... I've always, I would love to meet him because he just seems like he might be the funniest man on the planet. And I might have this completely wrong, but Robert Huth, how funny <laughs> was Robert Huth? <laughs> very, very funny. Very dry, funny, mad. <laughs> A great lad. Great lad. He could, you'd walk into the gym some mornings, he's there doing one arm push ups. He was, <laughs> yeah, he's a great lad, though. Loved to tackle in training as well. But he was just, he was like a brick wall, mate. He ugh, solid. Even the physios, they couldn't tell where he was stiff because his body was just that solid. He was just like basically one big giant German muscle. <laughs> big Dolph Lundgren. But, yeah, it, yeah. He, he was just but another great lad. Another great lad, and a good player as well. I mean, you'd look at teams he played for before and yeah. games he played in. You, you, I mean, you don't you don't play for them types of teams if you're not a good player. No, absolutely um, not. Another another character that obviously they'd done the homework on to get in. One of the big things that Pulis was good at was the type of type of people he wanted. He got in uh, to to fit the group. Um, you don't do that unless you do your homework. It's fair. It's all well and good having you know good players, but. If they're not going to fit in with a group, it's never going to work. But yeah, he's some player, some defender. And you look at what he went on to do after Stoke as well with Leicester. Um, Won the league, didn't he? Exactly. Exactly. So, nah, another another top signing and another great lad. With Robert Huth, was it was he at Stoke when he got banned for posting what he did on Twitter? Or was that at Leicester? He got like an eight grand fine or a two-game ban or something. Was that the thing with him and Johnny Walters? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't yeah. I wasn't there then. I think it was at uh, Leicester. I feel like it was at Leicester, but it might have been. I it feel like he puts been. pay. You know when people say the Germans have no sense of humour, which is completely wrong by the way, but I feel like yeah. he's like literally like the he's the poster boy for proving that point wrong and, and showing that it is completely a myth. As it was with that season, um, unfortunately for yourself, you didn't end up, you know, maybe getting in the team as much as you wanted to, and ended up going on loan to Leeds. At the time, Leeds were in League One, but yeah. what what was it like playing for such a huge club with such huge expectations at maybe one of their lowest ebbs in terms of the league position? Obviously, two reasons why I went there. One, obviously Leeds United. Yeah, and and two. Being back with Simon Grayson again, um, it was. I loved my time at Blackpool with him. Got on with him really well. Yeah, it was for me. It was just a case of going to. Uh, obviously, yeah, it, Leeds was probably the only club I would have gone to in that league at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, to go and go to a massive club, massive fan base. A lot of pressure, and like I say, just test myself again. Really, test myself in terms of you know I'm, I'm dropping down a few a few leagues maybe, but I want to keep testing myself and prove that I am a good player. Um, and I wouldn't I wouldn't have gone if it wasn't for for Grayson. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to play games. I just wanted to play football. I wasn't. What What was Simon Grayson like? Because quite, obviously back, really. you've got a Netflix documentary there. <laughs> but still not seeing it. I like speaking obviously from the experience that I've had with him, he's yeah. Laid back, trusts his players, still demands the highest quality day in, day out, and just expects you to go and do your job, but enjoy yourself at the time, enjoy coming in, enjoy working. And and puts the belief in the lads that, you know, I'm Show, I'm telling you what I want from you. It's up to you lot to go do it. And don't get me wrong, he, he could he could lose his head at times. For me, he, he was he was brilliant with me. He, he always believed in me, trusted me to to go and perform. Um, and you know, you sometimes you you go places and it just doesn't work. It just doesn't mm-hmm. work out. Um, 
and obviously had a bit of a, a bad time at, at Sunderland. Um, from obviously like what people say, he's not been portrayed in the best of light on the on the documentary. But in, in, I can only speak for myself. I I think the bloke's brilliant, and yeah, you, you don't get you don't get as many promotions and do well as at many uh, do as well at, as at many clubs as he has unless unless you're a good manager. Yeah. And Leeds is obviously a huge club as well. I mean, obviously, Sunderland are the best club in the world, but um, <laughs> Leeds, Leeds are also pretty big as well. So, and he, and he got promotion with them also. But he, you went yeah. to to Barnsley the season afterwards, and you played under uh, Mark Robbins. Did did you yeah. enjoy your time at Barnsley as well? I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, I've been quite lucky actually with in terms of loan moves where I've gone. Um, Barnsley was brilliant. Um, being back in uh, a good league in the championship. Yeah. Championship, uh, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, didn't didn't really know anyone there at the time. My first, like my first, really, how can I put it, face to face with Mark Robbins and getting to know the lads. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, for me at the time it was it was a great move for me. Really, really enjoyed it. Another good set of lads I'd tell a lie I knew one it was Nathan Doyle he was there at the time but yeah I'd just just going and I'd test myself again I mean uh, Ryan Shotton came on loan with me at the same time so he was he was a younger lad as well so we, we were both going to test ourselves and try and do try and show ourselves in a good light um, it's a good family club Barnsley isn't it it's a, I've heard a lot yeah. of people say it's a good family club it's like it's yeah. The, the fans get behind you've got a good attendance there good, you know a good history as well I mean I always remember them as a championship club and I know they are at the moment but I know they've bobbed up and down but, but Barnsley's always been a, a good place to visit and it's always been a nice warm welcome it does feel very family oriented you meet meet the people the staff uh, that work here in the, in the stadium and the kit man and all that it, it's just just a lovely set of people just really nice couldn't, couldn't do anything more for you uh, just really friendly and you know, when when you're welcome to a place and people are like that, it always helps. Um, yeah, like I said, I, I, I really enjoyed my time. Really enjoyed working under Mark Robbins. For me, another another good manager and showing how good a manager he is now with Coventry. They're flying again. Yeah. And, you know, he's had a lot of difficult stuff he's had to go through with that club while he's been there. And, <laughs> One or two. <laughs> yeah. And... I've been quite lucky in turn most most of the managers I've been with have, have, have been good. And I love my time. Managed to get my first career goal while I was there uh, on loan there. Cardiff away. Last minute? No, it was Cardiff at home. I'd been trying to take a free kick for a while and I thought, you know what, well, I'm having this. Smack it as hard as I can. I've hit it. It's took a massive deflection off Chopper and gone in. <laughs> so... <laughs> Great feeling to get my first goal. Um, all my family were there, so yeah, really, really special feeling. And I, I, I do, I, I look back on the loan move at Barnsley as a, a really successful one that I enjoyed as well. You went to to Portsmouth, and I think, and this is just based on sort of research. You you might have a completely different thought process on this, but it, it seems like Portsmouth was difficult for you the first time around, a bit of a rough time. How did you find your time at Portsmouth and the first spell? Uh, really difficult, I'll be honest. Um, yeah. I just just had my little boy, um, mm-hmm. and so obviously, uh, well, but just the week before the start of the season, um, Mrs. was still pregnant, and then. Uh, yeah, the first game I think we played might have been Watford. Can't quite remember. But yeah, I had a, I had a tough a tough start. Didn't play well at all. Um, not the start I would have wanted to start my loan move off anyway. Um, but yeah, I just I find I find it really I didn't perform anywhere near where the the way I wanted to. Uh, and I, if anything, I almost probably tried too hard to put it right. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, obviously, uh, a few fans 
really didn't take to me at all. A couple of couple of difficult <laughs> shouts to deal with when you're taking a throw in or a corner or set play. It was yeah, it was a it was a completely different feeling than I've been used to. Um, they, were, they were a tough crowd, Portsmouth, aren't they? And I mean, I don't mean any disrespect them, but they're, they're a tough crowd when a good and passionate one, but a tough crowd. Well, I just I just kept thinking to myself, just right, start again, go again, keep work, keep your head down, keep working as hard as you can. Things will change, things will change. Don't get me wrong, I, appearances where I was, I was really happy with myself and some good performances here and there, but nowhere near. What the way I wanted to perform and how I wanted the loan move to go. Um, like I said, my, I found it difficult being away from my missus and, and my little boy. Um, don't get me wrong, we, she'd come and stay down sometimes, but obviously times when I'm not there away games, she was she was back home with her family looking after the baby. So it yeah. was it was something I thought I'd be okay with and I probably didn't know how much it was affecting me at the time. Yeah, of like course. Say once, and I prob- probably I probably I got myself too wound up with what fans were saying. I was probably buying into too much what what some of the stuff that they were giving. Don't get me wrong, it wasn't everyone. It wasn't everyone, but yeah, a lot of the times I probably did deserve it to be honest with you. Because like I said, I, I didn't perform anywhere near the way I wanted to. Some place to go and play football, old school ground, fans pack it out, do make some noise. Like you say, they're really like like any fans. They're, they're really passionate. passionate. Yeah. They're really passionate. And but yeah, I mean, I, I had a little fallout with the manager at the time, Mr. Cottrell. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, a, that's a throwback, Steve. For a Sunderland fan, Jesus Christ, oh, that's a throwback. <laughs> sure, yeah. He's a character, all right. Uh, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. We had a bit of a a bit of an argument. Me not playing and. I was actually training really well at the time. A couple of things went on, but nothing, nothing stupid. Like it was just a bit of a Barney on a on a training pitch. Yeah, and he he obviously believes in what he believes, and you know he's like I said for me, he, we didn't we. I didn't, he's not someone that I really. How can I put it? He wasn't for me. Let's say from the like I said, the managers I had. He's, he's, I didn't really connect with him and that probably affected the way I performed as well. And it was all, it probably just summed up the way that year went for me in terms of football. I performed badly. I didn't really like the manager. Don't get me wrong. I respected the fact of the, you know, because he, he obviously joined at a difficult time and he was, it was a bit of a rebuilding job for him, but managed yeah. to, to keep hold of some good players, managed to get some good players in as well. And it was difficult for him, but, for me, there was there was a lot of times when he could have probably stamped his authority a bit more and didn't. But yeah, like I say, it was, it was one of them. He's he, he obviously went on from Portsmouth. I think he went to Bristol City, didn't he? From there and did written amazing. I think so. That. Like I say, for me, that year was just a, a bad one. That's football, isn't it? Sometimes. Yeah. But talking about managers. You then eventually did leave Stoke and you went to play under one of my favourite people on the entire planet. Never met him. <laughs> I just know I would like him. Sean Dyche. Um, he seems to me like the kind of man that you'd kind of walk over hot coals to play for. Did you enjoy playing under Sean Dyche? Yeah. I, I mean, like, like I said, yeah, I've been lucky like with most of the managers I've had. Um, it was actually I'd, I'd, when I was signed there, uh, Ian Wong was the assistant under Cottrell at Portsmouth and because uh, I think it was Deitch's first season in football management yeah he, he rung me and uh, one of my old teammates at the time rung me he was playing there uh, super Johnny Eustace rung me and said you know are you interested I was like yeah because I, I wasn't doing anything at Stoke really at the time I wasn't playing spoke with spoke with um, Tony about it and he was he was different class for me he he actually wanted to give me another year he was like I don't want you to go I want I want you to stay around the lads I'll give you another year you're not going to play but I want to keep you around the dressing room and be part of the group I don't want to be that lad that sits there and doesn't do anything I yeah. want to I, I want to be the lad that can get to the end of my career and say I played this many games I played for this club and I can look back when I, the time comes 
to retire, I can look back and, and you know what, this game's here, this many games for this for this t- type of club. That was it. He was, you know what, shut my hands, wish me all the best, and and that was it. That was when I signed for for Watford. And Deitch was fantastic with me, absolutely fantastic with me. Um, well, great bloke. He, how can I put it? He's got the perfect mix between old school and how current he is with everything. And like you say, when you said earlier, he's break break walls down for him. He gives you yeah. that belief. And how can I put it? Not har- arrogance, but that swagger is just to say, come on, man, let's have it. He's got his values and the type of values that I'd luckily been brought on up with a lot with with Mr. Pulis as well. It was a nice thing for me, actually, that I was going to someone that liked hard work. You come in every day. Um, I remember my first training session, actually. I come out, I had no no shin pads on. He went, we wear shin pads here. And I kind of like chuckled. And he went, no, I'm deadly serious. We wear shin pads. So we were wearing shin pads in training. Very, very tough ending to, to pre-season. And yeah, we, we had a good year that year, I think. Where, where did we, that's a, I think we finished ninth, I think. Something yeah. along that line. Yeah, yeah. I think we finished ninth. We were doing really well. We some good players. Lads are still there now. Troy's flying. Um, Troy Deeney, he's at that at that point in time. You'd have never thought he'd have done. You know, he, he's he's one of them. He knows what he's good at. He's been unbelievable. I mean, you see him now. He's he's throwing some of the best Premier League defenders all over the place. So <laughs> he's he's a tough, tough, tough lad. But yeah, another another good group. And yeah, I really really enjoyed that first season. Obviously, the the stuff happens where the Italians take over and <laughs> you see he's he's been relieved of his duty. It was Zola, wasn't it, that came in next? Yeah, so the Pon- Ponzo, Ponzo family, I think they're called, yeah. Zola come in. Yeah, re- and do, do you know what? The pre-season was brilliant. Pre-season was brilliant. Uh, a lot more footballs were involved, but still didn't shy away from all of a sudden going, right, you lot are running. Believed in all that side of it. I think I actually started that, that first season he was there. I played a couple of games. Then all, all of a sudden, Ponzo family obviously owned two other clubs, down there, Granada in Spain and Udinese in Italy. So they decided to bring about 18 players <laughs> over from... Yeah, they had, they had loads <laughs> on loan, didn't they? That's right. They had about 11 right. players on loan or something. Yeah, it was... I remember, I remember walking into the changing rooms one day and... I was basically the new lad again, having to introduce <laughs> myself. Yeah, it was crazy, really. I said shout to everyone. Yeah, oh, that, <laughs> absolute madness. Absolute madness it was. Yeah, and then basically getting told that I'm not going to be anywhere from playing one week and then the next week basically being told I'm not going to be put anywhere near the squad again because <laughs> uh, they, want, they want these lads from these other teams to play ahead of me so that was pretty much the start of the end uh, from that moment but it was a shame really I got on really I got on really well with Zoli he was, he was fantastic with me and I enjoyed going there and training and doing everything but from that I uh, went I don't know what this Coventry or Portsmouth Portsmouth yeah Portsmouth yeah did he have any hesitation in returning to Pompey because of what had happened beforehand? To be perfectly honest, I kind of wanted to go back and prove a point kind of thing and show people. Yeah. But kind of knew Portsmouth were in a bad state at that time. But I could have never, I could have never have imagined that it was as bad as it was. Mm-hmm. Um, and I probably went back when I shouldn't have done in terms of the way the, the football club was struggling at the time. Uh, but I just, I just wanted to get anywhere, just out of there to go and play football. I was that frustrated with not playing football. I needed to go somewhere, and Kai Whittingham, who was in charge at the time, he was like, "Can you just come and play some games?" <laughs> uh, so, so, so that was that was it really. Um, but went back, and it was like I say, it was a difficult time. Lads, lads were on like months and month contracts there, and it was crazy really what was going on at the club at the time. Um, yeah, it was a mess so at one, yeah, and one, one looking back now, I, I probably shouldn't have gone. 
And at the end end of that month loan, uh, I was like, no, nah, I, I can't, I can't stay, I can't stay. It was, it was not some, it wasn't great. Let's put it that way. Um, so yeah, Portsmouth had probably been my two, um, the worst times in my career, really. It's just places you go sometimes and it just doesn't happen for you or work out. Yeah. And Portsmouth seemed to be my bogey one, so... <laughs> it's funny, though, you mentioned about going certain places and you're thinking, should I go, should I not go, should I have hesitation, have I made the right move, have I not? I think everyone has that thought in, in life, let alone footballers, but you played for Stoke, really well liked at Stoke, had a really good reputation at Stoke, and then you went to Port Vale. Now, yeah. there must have been a bit of hesitation in that. <laughs> yeah, because um, uh, basically um, at the end of the second season at Watford, um, it was a bit, it, it was madness. Really. I got married that summer. Mm-hmm. and got told we were back in for pre-season on a certain day um, so I'm like yeah no problem all thingy get a phone call saying oh we're back in earlier um, so I had to cancel my honeymoon do all that I had to cancel it all uh, two days before we drew back in get another call saying oh actually we don't we don't want you around for the first team for pre-season <laughs> <laughs> so I'd cancelled all my honeymoon for no reason, um, just to be told that no, you're not training. But luckily, I was, I got on really well with the the youth team coach at the time, Dave Hughes, um, and I knew that his his pre seasons would be tough. I thought, right, I'll, you know what, I'll I'll go with the youth team. Then went and did my pre season with the youth team, worked me nuts off to get myself fit. And then the, the Port Vale thing come up. I was like, you know what? I've been away from my family again for the last two years. Train journeys, car journeys. This this is the time when I can be close to home. And yeah, you know, it didn't it didn't really bother me who, who it was. To be honest, I just wanted to be back closer to home. It just happened to be Port Vale that's Stoke's biggest rival, um, and. When I went to meet Mickey Adams, actually, he was, it, it was the first thing he asked me, really. He was like, are you, are you going to be able to deal with it? And I was like, do you know what? People from around this area, uh, similar to, to where you're from, actually, they, as long as you, you work your nuts off, they can, they can forgive anything else, really. As long as yeah. you're, as long as, as long as you give everything you've got and leave it all out there on a the pitch. And you, you can't ask any more of that. And that's typical of the way Stoke people are. And I thought, you know what, I've just got to go and keep my head down, give everything I've got and show that I'm not here to mess about. I'm not just come back just because it's close to home. I actually want to come back because I want to kickstart my career again. You know, it, is, it stops really for just over half a season. Um, um, Because like I say, the end of that second season, I spent the last two months of that season actually training at Stoke with Pulis. Yeah. yeah, I'd I'd been training back home because Zola was like, there's no point you keep coming back down here when you said you might as well train at Stoke. I trained at Stoke for the last two months of that season. So I'd done nothing really. So I was like, right, this is the point, back home, fresh start, kickstart my career again and go and enjoy football just enjoy being the football what's Tom Pope like? great lad I remember, <laughs> I remember actually he's, um, my first train, couple of training sessions um, he trained he trained like a bag of shit <laughs> <laughs> and I remember going to Mickey Adams I remember going is, is, is you know is this like your striker? And he was like, "Yeah, trust me," because I'd obviously heard he would scored like thirty goals or something the year before. Yeah, and I'm thinking, how's this lad scored thirty goals? And I joined him. Mickey was like, "Trust me, trust me." He, I, you know, he said, "I can let him off the way he trains sometimes because he does what he does on a Saturday, and then he does what he does." He goes, he bangs out of him from anywhere. He's, do you know what? He's finishing brilliant. 
he doesn't look it, yeah. but he can finish. He can finish, honestly. I've never seen anyone be able to, in terms of where he wants to put his headers and directing headers for a striker, he's probably the best I've seen, really. Um, don't get me wrong, he's a moany, moany fucker. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, good lad. Good lad, he is what he is. He, he's... He's such a down to earth lad. He had, he, he comes from, I think he comes from quite a rough part. Yeah. And, so, and he's obviously, you know, I think he was a window fit before he even got into football. So that he, was right. Yeah, he was he was yeah. window fit, wasn't he? That's right. Yeah. So he's he's never come away from what's got him to where he is. You know he. He's one of them. If, if he trains all week, he plays a game on the Saturday, he can go and have a beer. And that's, <laughs> no, but that's that's the way that's what you want, he, he yeah. is. That's the way he is. And, you know, he, for what he's done at Port Vale and the goals he's scored, he's, legend, he's incredible, he? really. He's, he's a legend there. He is a legend there. And he deserves anything he gets from that club because he's been such a good player for him for years now. And rightly, he'll go down as a legend. But great lad, funny lad. He's the, he used to be the only footballer that I had, like his tweet notif- notifications on my phone, because I knew <laughs> when he was tweeting, it was going to be something that was just going to be either hilarious, the, <laughs> the biggest dig at somebody else, or something that was going to get him in trouble with the FA. So I thought, stick him on notifications, it'd be brilliant, him. And he's superb. I think he's been um, kicked off Twitter now, though. I think he's been booted off about five times. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You'll never get rid of him. People like that you can't control. That, that was probably when he we'd been given a Monday off and he might have had a little slurp on a Sunday. And he <laughs> thought, Do you know what? He, I, I'm sure. I'm sure he used to just do it just to get people to bite. Yeah. He loved it. Oh, he loved it. He loved getting people to nibble. It's like his whole persona, I, isn't it? I, I find myself waiting on a, like a Saturday or a Sunday, just waiting for his tweet, just to see what, <laughs> who he's got nibbles from. He was, yeah, he knows how to he knows how to rub people up the wrong way. So I suppose j- just to sort of finish, obviously you had time at Notts County and you know another club that actually did really well with finished fifth in the playoffs, but that's when that's also one of itself. But you're currently at Yeovil. Um, yeah. disappointing to be relegated last season but although we don't know if this season's going to kick start or what's going to happen with it currently in fourth chance of promotion um, have you been enjoying like your football at, at the age you're at now maybe the, the back end of your career as opposed to a, a teenager <laughs> yeah I, I love it I still love it mate I didn't I didn't love it last year I must no. admit uh, I joined last year the start was okay um, and then all of a sudden it hit imploded yeah it, was, I think, uh, it wasn't it wasn't uh it wasn't a good place to be mate i'll be perfectly honest i uh two managers i haven't really got on with and one was last year with um darren way um we just seemed to clash um he was no nah, he he was not a bloke I particularly got on with or liked, I'll be perfectly honest. Uh, a lot of things that I didn't agree with what he was doing. Um, a lot of things that I thought he was trying to dig me out for um, for no reason. And, yeah, it was, it was a bad year. And one that ended badly with myself being told to stay at home uh, for reasons I don't know why. I could understand if I was, you know, a, a, an idiot around the place or, you know, causing harm or causing disruption throughout the group. But, I mean, you ask any lad that I've played with, that's that's not the type of person I am. It's not the t- type of person I want to be. I want to come in. I want to enjoy myself day in, day out. I want to work my nuts off and go home knowing that I've, I've done something uh, throughout the day. But... Um, yeah, that was that was a bad day, but a bad year. Sorry, but um, this year I found I found my love for football again. The the manager, uh, 
Darren Saw, he's he's been different class for me. You know, we had a great chat in the summer about what we're going to do, um, and I've loved it. I've loved my football this year. Um, we're doing well, and yeah, it's just a shame, a shame what's happened's happened. But yeah, I mean, it's you know people's lives matter. That's all that matters. Football is just a, it's just a thing. You know what I mean? This is yeah. this is people's lives. This is. You know, it's it's killing people, and it's just football. It's just football. Don't get me wrong. I think everybody's waiting for the day that it can start up again. I'm the same, like everyone else. But uh, with what happens with the season, I haven't got a clue. I haven't got yeah, a clue. What we're going to, do, to be honest, mate, I, no idea where it's going to go. I keep going. I keep going for all these different scenarios in my head, but. You know, are they just gonna think? You know what? It's all done. Leave it. No one goes up. No one goes down. Um, Is I don't. I don't know. I honestly don't know, mate. But I guess that's for the the powers that be. Yeah. Decide. But hopefully, we'll have some kind of conclusion. I'll be at least be back on the pitch sooner rather than later. But Carl, that was superb. Thank you very much. No Um, problem. Really enjoyed the chat. Um, there was a couple of fireworks going on outside my window, which you might be able to hear in the podcast. I don't know, but um, that was that was us just celebrating your move to, to Portsmouth because they came around that time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, keep safe, mate. Thanks for, do, mate. Uh, ever so much for coming on. Um, and obviously, hope that we're back on the